looking at uh, the second to last chapter, we're in verse 1 here, and it says, Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just to please ourselves. Now remember where we are in this, because last week it was about smoking and drinking, and it was about the people who have weak faith, and how some people can't even eat meat. Some people take the slightest sip of wine and they freak out and their, their, their conscience goes, boo, 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 evacuate. And they're freaking out. And Jesus is saying it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but it's his heart. So Christianity is about a heart surgery. It's not about food and drink. In fact... We learned that last week. It says the kingdom of God is not about food and drink. So we talked about how things like smoking, well, yeah, it's hazardous to your health. Watch out. Drinking too much, it's dangerous. Watch out. But there's nothing about these physical elements that defile our righteousness. It's really going to come down to God-given wisdom and discernment. And then you've got a church full of people... And then you got a church full of opinions about stuff like that. And so what he's saying is, if you know your freedom in Christ, if your faith is strong, bear with those whose faith is weak. Don't judge them. Don't come down on them. Don't go, don't go saying, hey, you don't drink. Why don't you drink? What's, you know, I drink. I understand my freedom. I drink as much as Jesus drinks. What's wrong with you? And see, all of that is arrogance, not love. So he's saying, bear with those who, who uh, have weak faith. He says, each of us is to please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Edification. An edifice is a building. Think of some of the largest buildings in the world, the skyscrapers. What, what, what uh, this passage is saying is, let's build people up, not tear them down. Legalism and judgment, making judgment calls about people's opinions... All it does is divide people and tear them down. What God is interested in is building people up, not fighting over food and drink. So he goes on and he says, For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. So Christ lived this life of not my will, but your will be done. And if they're insulting you, Father, they're insulting me, and I will bear the punishment. And he took on some things that really didn't even belong to him, and he did it for us. It's interesting, though, if you have looked at some of the theologies floating around today, there's some theologies saying that Jesus didn't die for our sins. But it's right there in the scripture, and they're saying it didn't happen, that he didn't die for our sins, that he just sort of... Genesis and there's God concerned about sin, making judgment calls about sin, punishing sin, sacrifices begin for sin. You look at the law and the prophets and all of this and the history of it. Then you fast forward to Revelation and God is judging sin. People that don't... Revelation 20, they experience judgment for sin. Clearly, God is not just one big ball of nice... Sin is evil. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ took our punishment in full. This is not being light on sin. The grace message, the gospel, is not light on sin. It's heavy on sin. The wages of sin is death. Nothing short of death. And Jesus died, paid it in full... There are no wages left. Now, I'll tell you who the guy is who's being light on sin. He's saying, well, God doesn't judge sin. God doesn't care about sin. Sin's no big deal. I never sinned. God's just nice, nice, love, love, nice, nice, love, love. That's all he is. That's light on sin. What we're saying is the wages of sin is death. Jesus died. Do the math and celebrate. 
For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Now, you know, I get a lot of emails. You should see my inbox. I get some emails, some crazy emails, some sane emails, and then some emails that are kind of in the middle. Now, you know, one email that I get keeps coming up now and then every few months is this verse here. See, Paul says in Romans that the scriptures, which obviously mean the Old Testament here, because the new wasn't written yet, obviously the scriptures are, you know, for us, all the scriptures. And to that I say, uh, yeah, no one's talking about tearing out the Old Testament. No one's talking about taking your Sharpie and just start marking through Leviticus or something. All scripture is inspired and useful for teaching. But what are you going to teach about it? Are you going to teach no pork sandwiches? The barbecue is canceled this Wednesday. (laughs) Not really. Are you going to teach something out of Leviticus like it's for us today as a requirement? All scripture is inspired. It's all the word of God, but there's a surprise ending. The cross, the resurrection, we're dead to the law, we're free from the law, we're not under the law, we're not supervised by the law. Romans says Christ is the end of the law. So I look at the surprise ending and I put my glasses on, those new covenant glasses, and then I turn and I read Leviticus with new covenant glasses on. And I say things like, hmm, isn't that interesting for them? Wow, look how God moved and worked. And then I see the story of Israel and their faithlessness. I mean, you know, insulting God big time. And God hangs with them and hangs with them and hangs with them. And I see this story develop. And you know what it becomes for me? Encouragement. It becomes encouragement and hope. It shows me perseverance. It instructs me in that way, but I don't go looking for rules about diet and rules about sacrifices and rules about altars because there ain't no altars. There's one thing, the cross of Jesus Christ that replaced all altars. As I've said many times, this is a table, it's no altar. And this is a building, it's no church. We are the church. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. Unity. Let's be together. Let's not fight and bicker over dumb stuff. So that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is the big deal? Man, I wish that we could get the big deal in our heads and just be obsessed over the big deal. The big deal is Jesus Christ. The big deal is not a set of doctrines. The big deal is not bickering over the Sabbath and the law and all that till kingdom come. The big deal is Jesus Christ. What did he do? What did he do for me? What does it really mean? What did he do for me? What did he do to me? What has he done in me? What will he do through me? The big deal is Jesus Christ. And this is who we rally around. There are people that will tell you that prophecy and them as prophets are the big deal. There are people that will tell you their spiritual gift is the big deal. And you need the gift that they have. There are people that will tell you that miracles are the big deal. Jesus did miracles every single time it was to testify about him. He raises Lazarus from the dead, even as we saw in the production of Epic. He raises Lazarus and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He feeds the 5,000, and then he says, 
I am the bread of life. Do you see it? It's not about the miracles. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the big deal. The big deal is not prophecy. The big deal is not miracles. The big deal is not spiritual gifts. The big deal is Jesus. We're going to find ourselves, some of us, saying, God, look how I spoke in tongues. And he's going to say, look how I spoke in love on that cross, and in that burial, and through that resurrection. I don't care if you speak in tongues, or you speak in English, or you don't even have a tongue, and you glorify me in your heart. I don't care if you raise your hands, lower your hands, have your hands in your pocket, have them back folded like this. It's not about your hands, and it's not about your tongue. It's about your heart that give thanks gives thanks about the big deal that is Jesus Christ. This is what unifies people. Everything I listed, when it becomes the big deal, it divides people. Therefore, (laughs) there it is, accept one another. Just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. I love this verse because... Seems like we got a whole lot of Bible talk going on. Oh, grace, grace, grace. Yeah, heard of grace, read about grace. I've done grace. Grace is good, thanks. Grace, it becomes a buzzword. Oh, yeah, God loves me. I know God loves me. I saw it in the football stadium, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Thanks. Love, grace, generic things that we just sort of become numb to. But acceptance... I'll take you just as you are. Not trying to fix or change. I embrace you just as you are. Now, is God a hypocrite? God's no hypocrite. And he's saying to accept one another. He's telling us to go model, reflect what he's done for us. Accept one another just as I've accepted you, with no strings attached. For I say that Christ has become a servant to the circumcision, hey, that's Jews, on behalf of the truth of God, to confirm the promises given to the fathers, that's Jews, and for the Gentiles. (laughs) I wonder what kind of acceptance these guys needed. See, think about Rome, the Romans, the people getting this letter... Some of them have a Jewish hat on. Some of them have a Gentile hat on. And they've been fighting over their hats, so to speak, their cliques, their groups, their clubs, and they're not accepting each other. You're too judgmental. Well, you're too dirty. God should have never given you a chance to begin with. You're a heathen pig. (laughs) I mean, let's tell it like it is, right? This is what's going on. And he's telling these two guys, take off your hats. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ. So he says, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. Again he says, now now, slow down. What are we doing? What are we reading? We're reading Old Testament quotes about those dirty pigs getting the gospel. And so what Paul is saying is, he's saying, hey, you over there, Jewish scholar guy. Yeah, you. The guy that thinks he's such a know-it-all about the law, the guy that's so arrogant with a chip on his shoulder, saying that the Yahweh is just for you and your club. Hey, How about we check out some of your scriptures, huh? How about we just take a minute and and check these out? What in the world do they mean, huh? Among the Gentiles, giving praise. Again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And the Jewish man is scratching his head. Huh? Where'd that come from? Never saw that before. Again, Isaiah says, There shall come from the root of Jesse, 
And he who arises to rule over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. Isn't that cool? Do you see this? It's about you. This is about you and me. We would not be here today if this were not predicted, prophesied, and now fulfilled in Jesus. That the two groups, Jew and Gentile, become one in Jesus Christ. Now, think about the implications of this for your life. Did Paul go marching into Rome with Moses under his arms? Okay, not Moses, but I mean the Ten Commandments under his arms? The 613 Jewish laws and say, let's take uh, the first year and, and get through the law together and then we'll get to Jesus. Is that what he did in Rome? Is that what he did in Corinth? Is that what he did in Galatia? No way. In fact, that was his nemesis. That he would come into Galatia and teach Jesus and then 30 minutes later some other guy would come in and teach Moses. You foolish Galatians, who has tricked you? You're Gentiles. You were never even given the law. It's not two covenants, it's one. The new covenant or nothing at all. And this is why Jesus Christ, even as he held that cup in front of his Jewish colleagues, he said... This is the new covenant in my blood. It's new for you, Jew, but it's the only covenant the Gentiles will ever see. Do you hear that? It's new for the Jew, but it's the only one for the Gentile. They were never invited to the Jewish law. And so what we're going to celebrate in just a little bit, is that his body was broken and that in his body the two became one. And that means you were included. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And concerning you, my brother, and I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness. Remember the edifice? edification, the building up, the encouragement. Look at what he's, he's doing it. You're filled with all goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. And I've written very boldly to you on some points so as to remind you again because of the grace that was given me from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. That's Paul's job. Not a fun job, to be honest with you. Sometimes. You know, out on the streets, attacked by wild dogs on your way to speak to some Ephesians who your Jewish buddies back home are saying, what are you talking to the Ephesians for anyway? I'll tell you why you got attacked by wild dogs because God's trying to tell you something. <laughs> what are you in the lineage of Job? You got turmoil heaped on you by God Almighty. And they're still, those guys... They're still doing it today. Oh, yeah. Just Google the Oklahoma tornadoes. And you'll figure out in five minutes that, oh, yeah, it's Oklahoma's fault. See, that's what some preachers are saying. That's what some Christians are saying. And it's because we've got our Christian karma going on here. We're going to grab a little bit of Jesus and a little bit of Eastern karma... And then we're going to say, God's going to get you. Well, the whole point is, God got Jesus in your place. And it's God's will that none perish, but all believe. Now, if it's God's will, if the scripture says that it's God's will that none perish, but all believe, then what in the world is on God's heart? And why is he snuffing people out before they could believe? It doesn't make any sense at all. And so what we're seeing here is that the reality is Jesus Christ took that punishment in full. God desires to save people, not destroy them. 
Oh, planet Earth has plenty of things to throw your way. You may lose your job. You may lose a family member. I've lost four, five, six family members in the last 15 years. Not killed by God. Killed by bad choices, drugs, suicide, AIDS. I mean, planet Earth hits, and it hits hard. So what we learn then is that Earth comes at us, but Christ works in us as a comforter and a counselor. But certainly not as they're saying on the Internet, a killer. Jesus Christ was killed in our place. And that is the whole point. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified, made holy, set apart by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ, I've found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. I won't presume to speak of anything except what Christ has done through me. This is not some new trendy thing. Christ in you, Christ through you is very, very old. He's been doing it for thousands of years. Christianity is not some certificate to reach heaven. Salvation is not a piece of paper. Salvation is not uh, uh, some book that you study. It's not a piece of paper or a book. Salvation is a life that starts now. Eternal life is not your life made longer. Eternal life is not your life made better. It's not your life with a little whipped cream of the Holy Spirit on top. Eternal life is dying and getting a whole new life that starts now. Eternal life is Christ's life. Christ in you. Christ through you. This doesn't have to be about Ephesus and Galatia and being some apostle on the road. It can be about the soft word spoken to your children. It can be about the hug you give when someone feels like a nobody and they just need a hug. Christ in you, Christ through you, uh, takes on a thousand flavors, and only you can be you in Christ. There's never been, in the history of the universe, there's never been another you, and there never will be. And so what God is saying is, there's a thousand, there's a million and eventually there's a billion canvases. And you're one of them. And I want to paint my life on your canvas. Your canvas has never existed and never will again. You're unique. You're special to me. I accept you as you are. And yet I also invite you to just let me paint my life on your canvas. Christ through you resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders and the power of the Spirit, all these things were evidenced. Oh yeah, you know that Yahweh who parted the seas? You know that Yahweh who did this miracle and that miracle? He's now found in the face of Jesus Christ. And here's your miracles to prove it. But it's about Him. So that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have, pr have fully preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're going to pause here. I want to ask the leadership to come forward. And we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning uh, together. And so if you're on the leadership team, go ahead and come up and we're going to pass out the uh, bread first and talk about the significance of this celebration. Now... I hope you see the connection. Guys, we just talked about two groups that hated each other. I mean hated. You know, 
the Gentiles felt like a nobody, and the Jews were the ones telling them that. And so, you know, it, it's essentially racism is basically what it is. The Jews believed there was one race, one people that belonged to God, and everybody else forget you. So what we celebrate this morning in Jesus' body being broken is essentially God's answer to racism. That's what it is. It's God's answer to racism throughout the ages. And see, nearly everyone in this room, unless you're a Jewish person, you were a victim of that, of that racism from Jew to Gentile, of that bigotry, of that division, those factions, those fights, those arguments. And so when you take and you eat this morning, I want you to think about where this came from, that it was taken from a loaf much bigger than this, and you're a piece of it and, and it, and it belongs. Just as you and I, we each belong to something bigger now. The end of racism, the end of bigotry, God's answer is unity, but it's not some fluffy notion of acceptance. There's a, re a reason to it. The reason is Jesus Christ, and for some people that stings. Jesus Christ is a stumbling block, an offense. For some people, the message of the cross stings, but for us, we see that it's life and peace with God, and togetherness, and unity. And that's what we celebrate this morning. You know, I, I want to I say you know, something I haven't really gone into at length in, in a few months at least. It seems like a lot of churches, a lot of religious groups, a lot of people around the world were just, were just getting this thing wrong. And I'm not saying that we do it perfectly or that we do it the best. I'm not saying that, you know, in the early church they met in homes. They were circled, huddled around. They would eat a whole meal together. Here we are with a shot glass and a little crouton. <laughs> it's not perfectly done. Maybe the way it was done thousands of years ago. But as the church has grown and the numbers have grown and people all over the world are saved and in Christ now, we've adapted and adjusted. We wouldn't all fit in one home. We wouldn't be together like we are today. So there's one advantage to this. But still, we can get this drastically wrong if we don't watch it. And maybe you've seen that. The lights go down. The hearts grow sorrowful. The tears come out. The memories of all of our sins flood our minds. Oh God, I'm unworthy. Oh God, I don't have a right. Oh God, I need to, need to, need to get right, get right, get clean, get right, get clean. And I think it all stems from one verse in Corinthians where he says, let a man examine himself. Right? Let a man examine himself. Well, as I've shared with you in the past, I mean, if you take 30 minutes and just enjoy that chapter, what you find is they're eating about 100 times this, and unfortunately, they might even be drinking about 500 times this, and it's not Welch's. <laughs> and so they end up passed out on the ground, laying back, snoozing in their lazy boy chairs, and the poor people show up and get nothing. And so in that context, and for that reason, Paul says, let a man examine himself. You're acting like idiots. This is the Lord's Supper. It's about the Lord. It's not about getting drunk and stuffing your stomach and, and insulting the poor people. It's about Jesus. So the Corinthians, hopefully, they get to their right mind and they say, okay, Paul, okay, I, get, I got you. We're going to start waiting for each other till we're all present. And then we're going to eat and drink together, like you said. And we're not going to drink too much and we're not going to eat too much. We're going to focus on Christ. 
not on filling our stomachs and basically robbing the poor people of an opportunity to eat. We're going to wait. We're going to do what you said at the end of the chapter. So then, my brethren, when you come together, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home first so that you don't come together for this judgment and bickering thing. So maybe they nodded their heads and said, okay. Now, fast forward, shh, 2,000 years later, west of the Atlantic, in the United States, in Texas. Some places have taken that verse, and so they just shut down the whole thing until you get qualified by examining yourself. What did I do last week? What did I do last month? How many times have I sinned? Did I confess them all? Did I forget one? God, I'm sorry, please qualify me. Please qualify me. And the whole point is His blood qualifies you. So I will advise you, if you're back there getting drunk right now, anybody? (laughs) Maybe that's not the best choice. Examine yourself. If there's anybody that plans on just taking that bread and kind of running out the back door and chomping down on it as an insult, don't do that either. But how about, here's a crazy idea, how about we do this in remembrance of him, not of our own track record? Let's pray and give thanks to our God. Father, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for your body, your son's body broken for us. We thank you for the unity that it brings us, that we we as Gentiles now get to be included. We thank you for this, Father. We celebrate the finished work of your Son. It is good. It is good. It is perfect. And it is finished. And it is the reason we're qualified. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. The leadership uh, is now going to give you a very conservative portion of non-alcoholic grape juice. because we're worried about you. And as we, uh, as we look at this, the meaning of this, uh, it just, I mean, it just gets better. The bread, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, resurrection life. If you eat of me, you'll never hunger again. Jesus is life, life, life. But sometimes we don't exude life. If you're like me, Sometimes you find yourself doing stuff you don't want to do, saying stuff that you regret later. The Apostle James, yeah, the faith works guy. James, the one that they say is the strict one, the real strict guy. In James, he says, we all stumble in many ways. Now, so... The Apostle James is recognizing the reality on planet Earth, that we all stumble in many ways. We don't always exude life. And so, what do you do about that? Well, fortunately, God already did something about that. And it actually worked. And so, the way that we get this wrong, of course, is... I mean, number one, you could... You could think that something is going to happen today, June 2nd, 2013, that as you drink this, something new is going to happen. Nothing new is going to happen today with regard to your sins. When you drink this today, it's about remembrance. Remembrance means it's already happened. Right? Why do you have a wedding anniversary? To remember the wedding. When you have an anniversary, are you getting married? No, you're remembering the wedding. Why do you have a birthday party? Are you being born? No, you're celebrating the birth. It's in remembrance of the birth. Why are we doing what we're doing today? Not because something new is happening today, but in remembrance of what we've already got. Do this in remembrance of me, he says. Now, the other thing that I think is just critical that we have blown 
we've just blown it in the Christian world today in many ways is, yeah, yeah, we say, okay, okay, nothing new is happening today. And we walk out of here, though, tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and we say, Lord, please forgive me, please forgive me, please forgive me, please forgive me. And it's almost like we imagine that as we ask, the words float to heaven, God looks down and sees our words, and then He zaps us with a new portion of cleansing. He forgives us and cleanses us because I asked. But that's not the way of the Bible. The way of the Bible has always been blood, not words, blood. Now, let me stop and say this. You know my side notes? You know how I like to have side notes? You know, like smoking is hazardous for your health. Here's another side note. Agreeing with God is healthy. It's good for your health. I agree with God that He's the creator of the world. I agree with God that Jesus Christ is Lord. I agree with God that that is sin and that is sin and that is sin and that we all stumble in many ways, including me. I stumble. And I admit this to you, God, freely. I don't have to hide it. I don't have to shove it in the corner. We all stumble. So I'm telling you about it. I'm asking that your spirit teach me and counsel me. But I am not sitting here saying, will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? Please forgive me. Send down, rain down that cleansing on me because that cleansing came by blood alone. Jesus Christ will never die again because it worked the first time. And that's why we celebrate in remembrance of what he already did. I don't say, God, please forgive me, please forgive me, I'm waiting to be forgiven. No, no. I say, thank you, God, for Jesus Christ who took away my sins once for all, Hebrews says. So it doesn't matter whether my insult to Jesus is about going to talk to a man in a wooden box It doesn't matter if my insult to Jesus is going to God direct and asking Him for something He's already given. My insult to Jesus can take many forms. But there's only one way to respect Him. And the one way is to look to heaven and to celebrate and to agree that it is finished. Let's take and drink together. I want to message while I'm not on mute, and we'll just finish out uh, this chapter, this uh, reading together in Romans. I'm not going to teach anymore. I just want you to soak in how he leaves these people. There's a lot here, uh, but we'll just read it quickly. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel... Not where Christ was already named, I was looking for new places. So that I would not build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, they who had no news of him, that's Gentiles, shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. For this reason, I've often been prevented from coming to you because I've been over here and over there and over here and over there. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come see you guys, whenever I go to Spain, for I hope to see you in passing and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. Let's hang out. Let's have coffee. But now I'm going to Jerusalem serving the saints for Macedonia and Achaia. I've been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do it and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Let's work together, teamwork. Let's share our money. Let's share our gifts. Let's share our abilities. Let's build each other up. 
That's what he's saying. Therefore, when I've finished this and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on my way by way of you uh, to Spain. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. I need you. I need your prayers. I'm an apostle, he's saying. I'm out on the road, but I'm not a lone ranger. I need you. And that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. This is uh, how the last chapter ends with a lot of goodbyes. I commend to you our sister Phoebe who is a servant of the church which is at Sancrea that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. And then we've got a lot of people being uh, greeted here, people named uh, names that uh, you and I aren't very good at pronouncing, names like uh, Junius and Andronicus. Andronicus probably had a hard time getting a girlfriend, is my guess. I don't. It's just... Hi, I'm Andronicus. Uh, it, doesn't, it just doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> Greet uh, Ampliatus, uh, Herodian, uh, Tryphosa, all of these people that we don't know. But here's the thing. What did we do this morning? What did Ecclesia do? We read out names like Carson Rhodes, Sidney Kennedy, Ryan Elder. In other words, look what Paul did. He took the time to single people out and say, we love you, we appreciate you, we greet you, you've been working hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, Hermes, these are not names that you want to name your children. Uh, I know it's the Bible, but come on, you're asking them to live a pretty tough life in America. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. Now I urge you, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions, hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you've learned, and turn away from them. Hit the the road. Hit the door. Don't mix law and grace. Don't mix error and truth. For such men are slaves, not of the Lord Jesus Christ, but of their own appetites. They've got smooth and flattering speech but they are deceiving people. For the report of your obedience has reached all. I'm rejoicing over you. Be wise in what is good, innocent in what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your foot. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, uh, Lucius, Jason, uh, all all of these folks uh, are greeted. And then he finishes and he says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. He's able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. What is that? That the Gentiles were picked to. This is a huge theme in Romans. This has to be what predestination was about. The mystery that was predestined and then revealed. It has been kept secret for long ages past, but now it's manifested. And it's been made known to all the nations, not just Israel, all the nations, to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for this opportunity uh, over the last many months to go through Romans and just see... We're justified, we're justified, we're made right, we're clean, we're close, and it's by grace, through faith. It's not of ourselves, it can't be, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. It's not half grace, it's not two-thirds grace, it's all grace. Father, we thank you for doing it all. Today was 